Coming up on DTNS, why you don't ransomware something as intention getting as a major pipeline, why Starlink isn't good yet but might still get there, and why forgetful AI is better than other AI. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 14th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Ling. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rom Dunwood. Drawing the top tech from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just reminiscing about uh, seeing Lord of the Rings in the theater uh, and uh, all kinds of good stuff on Good Day Internet. If you want that expanded show, become a member and get it. Patreon.com slash DTNS. We've got two people from Ohio on the show today. I hope you both win the lottery for getting vaccinated. Go Ohio. <laughs> Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Twitter added search to DMs on its Android app, which has been available on iOS since October of 2019, so Android's caught up there. The company will also expand search to surface results based on words used in conversation in those DMs later this year. Currently, search only applies to usernames. Foxconn, you know, the key iPhone assembler, is warning that the global chip shortage will hit its production output this quarter and that the lead time for getting some parts will be up to a year. A spike in COVID-19 infections in India is hitting Foxconn's production in that country, of course, with iPhone production at one plant down 50 percent after more than 100 employees at the plant tested positive. Apple said during its most recent earnings call that impact on iPhone production would be limited, but it does expect shortages of iPads and iMacs. According to the state-run China Transport News, 10 ride-hailing and freight delivery platforms in China, including Didi Shuxing, were called into a meeting with the country's state administration for market regulation and seven other government departments. Ride-hailing platforms were warned to address high pricing, unclear mechanisms for profit-sharing with drivers, and arbitrary pricing, while freight carriers were warned about abusing monopoly power with transport data and industry prices. Oh, here they go. Moving on to a different industry. Samsung updated the blockchain wallet on its mobile devices to let users transfer coins between phones using Bluetooth or a USB cable. The Samsung blockchain wallet was originally introduced on the Galaxy S10 series, providing encrypted local storage of cryptocurrency. On Friday, Ireland's high court dismissed Facebook's bid to block a European Union privacy decision that could suspend Facebook's ab ability to send information about European users to U.S. computer servers. This follows a preliminary decision on data flows that the court received back in August from Ireland's Data Protection Commission. Facebook had claimed it was not given adequate time to respond, but its bid was still dismissed. Ireland's DPC leads enforcement of EU privacy law for Facebook and other companies that have their European headquarters in the country. Well, let's talk about this week in ransomware. Uh, after that colonial pipeline attack, ransomware definitely in the spotlight. Uh, and we've got more news about it. Friday, the Irish government announced that the Irish Health Service's central data servers were under an attempted ransomware attack. It started at the Rotunda Hospital, but it seems to be more widespread. The system has been shut down in order to protect itself. We don't know who is behind that attack as of this recording. Toshiba disclosed that it had been attacked by Darkside, the same group believed to be behind the software used in the Colonial Pipeline attack. And Bloomberg sources say not only did Colonial Pipeline pay $5 million to Darkside, apparently within hours of the attack a week ago, uh, yesterday we talked about the possibility that they had paid it, but now it, the sources are saying, yeah, they, they paid it almost immediately. But that the decrypting tool that Darkseid provided was so slow that Colonial's IT workers continued using the company's own backups to help restore the system. A couple things to note here. Darkseid provides ransomware as a service, not only directly, but to affiliates. And it may be that an affiliate attacks Colonial, not Darkseid itself, and Darkseid was unprepared for the scale of that attack. Attacking a target as large and attention-getting as Colonial is unusual. Ransomware groups want to get their money and get out. They don't want to be noticed. They don't want publicity. Brian Krebs reports, in fact, that Darkseid is shutting down its service. A message from Darkseid posted uh, and then reposted on Telegram reads, A few hours ago, we lost access to the public part of our infrastructure, namely the blog, payment server, and DOS servers. The host of their stuff will only tell Darkseid that it is blocked 
at the request of law enforcement agencies. Darkside also says funds from a payment server were withdrawn to an unknown address. So it looks like the government, possibly others, uh, have come for Darkside. Darkside says it will release decryption tools to any targets who are still locked but have not yet paid. And the message is in part attributed to Revol, which is another ransomware as a service platform presumed to have overlapping membership with Darkside. Revol says it will continue to operate, but it will restrict its affiliates from targeting healthcare and education institutions or governments because they don't need that kind of hassle. Uh, intelligence firm Intel 471 believes ransomware operators are retreating from public view right now with the aim of resurfacing under new names with new software variants so they can't be linked to these attacks because the heat's on now. Well, gosh, a lot to parse here. Uh, the Irish Health Service uh, central data servers being attacked uh, goes against what I know a lot of ransomware companies claim to not want to do, you know, not trying to screw with the health of, you know, <laughs> a country um, and that kind of data. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with dark side. But yeah, the whole ransomware in the spotlight, and we touched on this with Justin Robert Young yesterday, is not that it's new, but boy, is it is it certainly in the spotlight these days? Yeah, this is why you don't go after a pipeline because then you get your servers seized and you you lose access to your money, which is against the whole operation, criminal or otherwise, right? Uh, you, you need access to your money. All crime is bad and you know it's all, all illegal, but you don't want the FBI problems that this company probably has right now. Uh, well, company is a strong word, but uh, that this organization yeah, yeah. has right now because they, they are in the crosshairs. You you caused people to put gas in plastic bags. That's that's not a good thing. <laughs> well, you may not have caused them to put it in plastic bags. But you, I get what you're saying. You created the conditions in which people are putting gas in plastic bags. That's not a, it's not a good thing. Uh, yeah, I I was I was taken aback by uh, the news on Krebs that that Dark Side had was shutting down. Uh, but I shouldn't have been. Uh, it's it is definitely we don't know, but it seems likely that it's the U.S. government saying we're not messing around. We're coming uh, for these folks and we we can track certain parts of your network and we're going to shut those parts of your network down. Uh, it's not surprising at all that given that dark side is retreating and saying, all right, let's just, you know, turn off the lights, uh, you know, burn all the papers, shred all the documents and get out of here. Uh, digitally speaking, uh, they're not gone. They're not leaving the game. They're just going to, you know, show up named something else, especially because with the overlap to Revil anyway, it's likely that that these are folks operating more than one organization as it is they might have a couple you know sitting on the back burner that they can fire up in a couple months once the heat is off yeah like i said you don't you don't want the fbi coming after you and they are firmly in their crosshairs as you stated yeah yeah uh, what may or may not be related to the investigation of the colonial pipeline attack bloomberg sources also say the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, a Cayman Islands company called Binance, is under investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice, the IRS, and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, the company itself is not accused of any wrongdoing, but the IRS is investigating both account holders looking for money laundering, as well as some employees. Uh, it's likely that that investigation was already happening before the Colonial Pipeline attack, uh, but certainly there might be some concurrent reasons for that. Um. Disney reported that its streaming service, Disney Plus, added 8.7 million subscribers in Q1, reaching 103.6 million subscribers worldwide. That fell just short of expectations, which were 109.3 million subscribers. By comparison, Netflix has around 208 million subscribers worldwide, but only added 4 million in Q1. A reminder, Disney raised the price of its package $1 a month um, to $7.99 on March 26. Disney CEO Bob Chappick said that Disney Plus is still on track to reach the goal of 230 to 260 million subscribers by the end of 2024. Disney's other two streaming services did quite well on their own. Hulu subscribers increased 30% to 41.6 million overall, and ESPN Plus customers increased 75% year over year to 13.8 million. Disney is making more deals that include the rights to stream content to ESPN Plus. Disney just signed new deals with Major League Baseball and La Liga Soccer. Yeah, that, that might be the most interesting part of this to me uh, is where we're going with live sports. Uh, we're st I've always wondered how live sports transitions from traditional cable TV to the Internet. And this 
is indicating the way. Uh, we're seeing it go to Peacock with NBC. Uh, we're seeing it go to Amazon Prime, uh, where they just only have it online. At least with Peacock, it's going to be both on cable and on Peacock. Uh, and it looks like that's what Disney's doing too. They've got some stuff that's exclusive to ESPN Plus, but they're as they sign new deals, they want to make it okay to simulcast to say yes, this will be on ESPN, but we can also put it on ESPN Plus without having to have uh, some extra deal, uh, which will make ESPN Plus more and more valuable to sports fans. And I I think that's how we see that transition happen is slowly things just move from one format to the other. So I am not terribly surprised that they missed their number, even though they didn't really miss it by that much. But, um, you know, a, a big reason for people cutting the cord is because they're trying to cut their prices or they're, they're trying to, you know, save money. They're trying to decrease the amount that they spend. And when you start adding all these things up, they, they are getting to the point to where they cost as much, if not more than what the cable subscription that you cut the cord, you know, a couple of years back might've actually cost. Yeah. So I'm not terribly surprised there. And, and I'm looking at that. They're still on track for 230 to 260 million that, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting just to see how the industry goes to see are, are they going to actually be able to make that number because, um, you know, they're, they're slowing down a little bit and, uh, you know, they, they've got to still do quite a bit of uh, selling of the service to get it to 260 million people. Yeah. And Netflix having 208 million subscribers adding 4 million in it's Q1 and people saying, Ooh, well, Disney plus is adding more folks than Netflix is, but Disney plus is also a lot newer. So you you know, there's, we're still in the discovery phase for a lot of folks that said, Anything that is released or at least a popular movie or series that's happening, and many have, Disney Plus, you know, had a had pretty good rollout out of the gate. That obviously affects numbers. The numbers aren't too short of expectations, but yeah, you can see where all of these services are going to get to a point where it's like the people who want to pay for it are for the most part paying for it and how do you get how do you get the the new folks coming in you know what yeah. what's the draw is is the price too high because if you're kind of on the fence you're like eh, i don't have eight more dollars a month that this just doesn't seem worth my time on the sports front like you mentioned tom this does get interesting to me especially because i mean i am getting and and a lot of this has to do with you know i, I don't watch a lot of live television anymore but sports or you know award shows or, you know, the, the few other things where I really do want to watch something live that does become a little problematic and something that, not that it's a pay-per-view model really, but something that's a little bit more of that a la carte. Like I just want to watch this specific game, you know, and I don't know what, you know, uh, network, uh, Agreements have been made. I don't really care. I just know that I can go to my Peacock streaming service or whatever it may be and get that game. And maybe it's maybe it's something where I'm only paying for that month of the service rather than some sort of you know contractual agreement, which of course is the old way of doing stuff. The more that we get to that model, the happier I think a lot of people will be. Yeah, I I think uh, a cu a couple of things to to remember about this. One is. The perception is that this can cost more than cable, right? I hear that a lot, like you just said, Rob, and, and it certainly can, but you have more control over it is what I always try to tell people is like, it, but it doesn't have to. With cable, you paid or you didn't get it, right? Now you have control about putting these things together. But what I also forget is that there are still 60 to 70 million cable subscribers to which this is not replacing cable. It's on top of their already incredibly expensive cable bill. Uh, and that's another thing Disney and Netflix and everybody else is dealing with uh, is as people are now getting to go back outside and do more things here in the United States anyway, uh, they are looking at these expenses and saying, well, hold on, maybe I don't need all of these. And and just like we had no precedent for how this was going to affect things when we went into a pandemic, we also don't have a precedent for how it affects things coming out of a pandemic. Uh, I think that applies to more things than this, just this. But, uh, you know, we're nobody really knows what's going to happen and what's going to stick. So it's interesting to see these numbers. 
Well, Google will provide network services to SpaceX's Starlink. CNBC sources say that under a seven-year deal, Starlink, the space-based internet service, will locate ground stations in Google Google's data centers starting in the U.S. and then use Google's private fiber optic network to access cloud services. This is going to reduce latency, not just with Google services, but also other services that use Google Cloud or geographically near Google data centers, of which there are many. It will help reduce latency and lag on Starlink connections. That is an ongoing issue. Starlink is also working with Microsoft on modular Azure cloud data centers that can deploy anywhere and also use Starlink for the connection. That is good news for the future of Starlink, as The Verge's Nilay Patel Friday called the existing implementation unreliable, inconsistent, and foiled by even the merest suggestion of trees. Though we did also say it's a remarkable feat of engineering. Starlink cur currently costs $499 to install and then $99 per month for 100 megabits per second service down and 20 up. So I'm glad that they're going to make it better. I actually have a former coworker who lives in the middle of nowhere. And what the pandemic did for them was that they were on the road up darn near 100% of the time, but because they were working from home and their internet was so bad at their house, they actually had to rent an Airbnb so they could literally drive into the city to be able to work just mm -hmm. because their internet connection was so unreliable out in the country where they live. So anything that's going to help those type of uh, you know customers just get better access um, for. Um, trees and tall buildings are an issue though. So we're gonna to have to see how they're gonna work around those things. Yeah, the, and, and uh, being able to provide uh, a service directly with Google data centers to reduce lag and latency is a big part of that. The other part is launching more satellites. <laughs> Uh, which is something that Starlink has a lot of controversy with because they haven't done a good job of working with the astronomical community uh, to, to work on a cooperative way to launch more satellites, and there's some opposition to them launching it. Uh, I think there's a solution to that where Starlink can get all the satellites up it needs. It, ju it just needs to reach out uh, to the community uh, and, and, and get them on board. But in the end, yeah, I, I think Starlink is going to be a reasonably reliable service, especially for people outside of cities. Uh, this line of sight stuff's always gonna be an issue when you're inside big cities. You know, everybody talks about Manhattan. How are you ever gonna get this to work in Manhattan when you got tall buildings everywhere? Um, you can mount it on top of the skyscrapers, perhaps, uh, and and do it that way. But honestly, where it's going to catch on and where it's going to be used the most is is in places where it's harder to to run lines and 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 provide reliable service. And and it'll take a few years to get there. But it does seem like Starlink is a is a viable way of providing that. At least with this deal with Google, it is. Mm -hmm. Hey, folks, we love patrons that stick with us. That's why we're happy to offer Patreon loyalty rewards. If you're a patron at a particular level, uh, you can get a unique sticker, mug, T-shirt, or hoodie every three months as long as you stay a patron at that level. Each one has a unique piece of art from Len Peralta. Uh, it either features the DTNS seven-year anniversary logo uh, or that logo with either Roger, Sarah, or myself. Uh, get all the details, and, and we shipped out a bunch of them this week. So uh, check your email uh, to see if you're getting one, patreon.com slash DTNS. Folks, what if every time you had to remember something, you perfectly remembered everything around it? Now, before you say that sounds great, think about it. You get up in the morning, and you're trying to remember how to make oatmeal, and you recall everything you know about water electricity, microwaves, farming, et cetera. That's too much. You don't need to wade through all of that to remember how to make oatmeal, but that's kind of what it's like for computers. All the data is preserved. And when a computer goes to look for something, it has to sort through all of the data to remember slash access what it wants to find. Now, computers are really fast at that, which is why they're great at sorting through and finding that, but it's still rather inefficient. And if they didn't have to do that, they'd be faster. Facebook's artificial intelligence scientists have developed a method for systems to forget irrelevant information in order to improve speed and efficiency of these algorithms. They call the method expire span, expire dash span. It predicts how important a piece of information is expected to be in the given context and then gives it an expiration date. The less important that info is, the sooner it expires. This eventually 
frees up memory over time. Each time a new piece of information is encountered, the relevance of related data is also reevaluated so that you keep the stuff that's relevant and maybe you push off some of the stuff you're like, I don't really need that anymore. One of the examples they gave in the blog, if you're having a hard time imagining this, uh, was a word prediction task. You're asking a, an algorithm, predict what the next word is gonna be in this sentence. That system can be taught to remember rare words like names, which would be harder for it to predict, but forget filler words like the and of, which are easy to predict without having to remember them. That method is closer to how we do things. The team is researching how to incorporate other types of memories into the neural networks as well, uh, with a kind of a lofty long-term aim of replicating how humans remember stuff. But this is, this is definitely a way to improve the speed and efficiency of AI. Yeah, this is really cool. I actually read this story twice just to make sure I was, uh, you know, picking up on what was going on here. And, you know, being a former big data guy, um, you know, the, the more stuff that is in memory that you have to recall, the ultimately the longer it's going to take to do it. Now, I know these computers are extremely fast at doing that, but ultimately there's going to be um, diminishing returns of just storing all data for all time. And we used to think that that's how computers would work. They're just going to know everything. But no, they don't. They they just need to know what they need to know. Um, and this is really cool tech. And you're going to see, um, you know, it, it, as this stuff gets developed, I think you're going to see uh, things that it's going to think like a human. Um, I mean, that that's what they're ultimately trying to get to. And this is a, definitely a step towards that. Yeah. One of one of the things that I I, I was kind of with you, Rob, where I was like, okay, let me th think like a computer. Okay, what I I love the the example of, yeah, predictive text. That makes a lot of sense. Like there are certain article words where you, you, the computer doesn't need to have that at the ready all the time, can kind of thin out some data uh, and, and, and free up space for uh, more intensive uh, computing power. But there are a lot of other things that computers don't do in the way where as a human, I might be searching for a word, right? Like, okay, I can think like this example, but it's hard for me to understand, okay, well, what is it like a concept that's not word related, like a verbal language that a computer can choose not to shuffle through, uh, wasting time. Uh, that is, that's thinking a whole different way. Yeah. I, I was, uh, thinking about it while, while you were, were talking, Robbie, you, you reminded me of, of just plain old defragging a hard drive, right? The reason you defrag a hard drive is because there is some information on your hard drive that is more important and accessed more often. So you want to move that closer to the center so that the read head doesn't have to take as long to get out there and find it, right? You reorganize the hard drive so that it's faster because some information is relevant and, and some isn't. And this, this in some ways you can be seen as, as a, just a, a more complex version of that, of saying like information in general, forget about read speeds, uh, some of it doesn't need to be there clogging up the system and making us look through it at all. Yeah, and, and to your point, Sarah, um... You know, we oftentimes, I know I oftentimes try to think of a word and I have to, what is the acronym or what is the, you know, what is the word that I'm thinking of that is similar to this word? And we kind of stumble on that as humans. Computers are not going to have that issue when they know that they need to go get the data. They can still go get the data at the same speed that they do it currently. This is just going to give them the ability to be faster when they don't have to do that, which is uh, really exciting. Yeah, yeah. No, this is it's interesting stuff. One thing I'll give Facebook, their AI researchers uh, do, do a lot of really interesting work. Lenovo announced that Lenovo Go line of devices designed for users who work partly in the office, partly at home, and partly on the road. There is travel size wireless multi-device mouse that can connect up to three devices and supports wireless Qi charging available for $59.99 in June. There's also an $89.99 Lenovo Go USB-C laptop power bank, which can deliver up to 65 watts using a 20,000 milliamp battery and charge up to three devices at a time. More devices in the Go line, including audio devices, are coming later this year. Yeah, this is interesting just, just uh, simply because they are marketing it towards the hybrid workplace. They're yeah. like, you they know? are. Right. And I would say that their timing is impeccable because I know for me, 
I, I am ready to get out of the house. Um, I, I can see myself going and working in Starbucks, working in um, not necessarily <laughs> cola working places. I mean, you know, try to keep the coffee shops and stuff like that. But I want to go and do that. So if I can actually get me, oh, let me give me a mouse that I can wirelessly charge really easily. Or, or I need, you know, I need a new power bank that can charge my, my you know, my tablet or my small laptop. I'm looking for that kind of stuff. And right now is the perfect time to you know, actually have come out with these devices. So I think that's pretty cool. Well played. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is great timing. And I think that uh, at least for me, and I think we all probably, you know, on this show, we travel with more gear than perhaps the average person. But when traveling, you know, it was always kind of like, okay, what do I for sure just really need? Because I don't want to pack anything more than I have to. But that's more of a, I got to get on a plane and maybe need something while I'm on my vacation or where I'm working, you know, somewhat far away. The more kind of, I am a hybrid worker. I am in many places on any given day, or at least want to have the flexibility to be in more places than I used to. You know, I was either at home or at work type of a thing. It gives you a little bit more of an excuse to be like, okay, these, th these devices that make everything just that much more convenient start becoming things I might want to buy. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to fire trucks. Let's. This week, Clean Fleet Report, a couple days ago, wrote that the Los Angeles Fire Department, or LAFD, is showing off North America's first hybrid fire engine built by Rosenbauer Group, which is based in Austria. The LAFD purchased the Revolutionary Technology Truck, as it's known, for $1.2 million last year. It has two electric motors with a total output of 490 horsepower, low center of gravity, optional integrated drone that could be used to scope out a situation out of uh, line of sight if there's a fire nearby and the lack of engine noise when a fire rescue team needs to communicate effectively at an emergency scene. So these are all things that make an electric fire engine uh, pretty attractive. Volvo Penta, creator of electric powertrains for a variety of applications, will power the truck has an electric drive unit based on one used in terminal tractors. Rosenbauer will also test three more trucks in Berlin, in Amsterdam, and in Dubai, and the unit may begin serial production as early as next year. Yeah, when uh, when I was first looking at this story, I was thinking, well, you you don't want your truck to be too quiet because you want people you want people to hear it coming when it, you know it's going down the street. Uh, but then it pointed out in the article, and Sarah, you pointed out in our, our production meeting to me that when you're on the scene. All those trucks make noise. And I, I did a little work in, in search and rescue, and I remember just how loud it was uh, when all the trucks are running for generators and pumps and, and sometimes just idling just, just in case, you know, they're needed at a, at a moment's notice. Uh, having an electric version of that, even if it's a you know plug-in hybrid, uh, is, is going to bring that noise level way down and bring the exhaust level down. It, it provides a, a lot of things on the scene that I, I think are incredibly beneficial. Yeah. When I read this, I just thought that did they add the drone in just for extra points? Because <laughs> you can't add a drone to a regular fire truck. <laughs> you can't. You can't. Yeah. No, the drone is important to have. They've been using it to fight fires quite effectively, but it's not like you couldn't have also had. I guess the idea right. is it can yeah. charge off of the battery from the electric truck. So yeah, yeah, it's like it's like the uh, the entertainment system upgrade. Yeah. Ah, should we get the drone? Yeah, might as well get the drone. It was already one point two million dollars. What's another drone? Yeah, that way you don't have to get the aftermarket drone. So yeah, right I, in. I I I look for. I mean, I don't live in the L.A. area, but I live in California, and fires are a, a, of utmost concern uh, to to us, and and certainly other states, and and all over the world, really. So yeah, the more that this can help folks who are doing the good fighting the good fight. Uh, I'm all for it. And yeah, the, the, um, the, uh, a fire engine that is less noisy when mm -hmm. emergency crews are needed to communicate with each other, not something I would have thought about, but makes perfect sense. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Got one from Nick. Uh, Nick says, I'm type 2 diabetic, and about nine months ago, I switched from finger sticks to the Freestyle Libra 14-day CGM. The advantage of Libra over the finger stick is that I can scan the Libra G CGM anytime with an app on my iPhone to get my current glucose level. I also don't have to carry my blood glucose monitor and supplies with me all the time. One disadvantage my Libra has is it doesn't generate any alerts for high or low glucose levels. I can only see when I perform a scan. If the sensor was in a smartwatch, I should be able to get true real time. That would help me monitor what I eat and how it impacts 
my levels. I also spend about $900 per year on the Libra CGMs. Buying an iPhone with a glucose sensor would pay for itself in less than a year. My health insurance may not cover the cost of an iPhone, but our company wellness program would cover most of the cost. Nick says a blood pressure sensor would also be very helpful since I have to keep track of that data because of my age and because of my health issues. Ah, Nick, really appreciate you uh, sharing your your direct insight uh, into that. Because I think a lot of times you hear about these health things, and if you don't have the concern, you you may not understand whether it's really helpful or not. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So it's it's exceptionally valuable to get that insight. Thanks for writing in, Nick. Absolutely, yeah. Especially when when you hear about well, here's here's how you do how you have to do it the hard way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to do it the hard way. So this is how much easier it would be for me. Yes. Thank you, Nick. If you have feedback for us, questions, comments, anything at all, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Mark Gibson, Reed Fischler, and Mike McLaughlin. Also. We have a brand new boss. Yesterday we said we were going to thank you, and we're going to. And today we're thanking Andy Toy. Andy Toy just started backing us on Patreon. Give Andy a round of applause, everybody. Andy, you're the best. Well, all our applause are the best, but Andy, you're also the best. Yeah. You could be the next Andy by backing the show right now. Just saying. All right. Let's uh, talk to Len Peralta, who has been busy illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us, Len? Well, you know, when I saw ransomware and dark side, mm. you know, I only went one way for me, right? So I, I, I felt like I had to do this. It was sort of uh, written in the stars. Of course, I drew dark side, but I drew the DC version of dark side, who uh -huh. looks like he's been pants. He's a little bit pwned here <laughs> oh. uh, because he, uh, he, you know, got caught with his hand in the cookie jar and uh, got all his toys taken away from him. Um, he's uh, there's a couple things in here. Uh, the uh, uh, he's he's saying I am many things, Kalal, but here I am a loser. Oh no, poor dark kind of, side. Yeah. I almost feel bad for him. Uh, I don't feel bad for him, <laughs> <laughs> but he does have little cute underwear. And uh, Nelson from the uh, from the Simpsons is also yelling ha ha in the background. Um, you can see this uh, at my Patreon if you're a Patreon backer, patreon.com forward slash len. You can get this immediately. You can also get it at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. And by the way, uh, just uh, uh, incidentally, I uh, you can also watch me draw these live pre-show, pre-DTNS on my Twitch channel, Twitch dot tv forward slash len peralta so check it all out folks thank you len and also thanks to rob dunwood for being with us today rob of the smr podcast which is some of my favorite weekend listening rob what's been going on with you not a whole lot folks can check me out at everything at rob dunwood and definitely come check us out over at the smr podcast we are coming up on episode 500 of just all kind of tomfoolery and hijinks and crazy talk about tech <laughs> Very good. Well, we're, uh, well, I'm not even going to say what episode number this is because I don't know, because we don't even really know what it is, but we are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern 2030 UTC. If you want to know more, you can find out at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live, and we'll be back on Monday with Jen Cutter. Have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Intern, Dr. Nicole Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S. One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, and Jack Shid. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Ryan Officer. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Rob Dunwood. Guests on this week's show included Robert Heron. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all our patrons who make this show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>